like I think Oscar so Wilde might have said that. Yeah. Uh, so I so thank you for answering it. Thank you for being comfortable with it. I, I think the only mistake of us was to let Nigel ask the question at the end. To write. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <It's not laughs> ah. This is not part of the session. Thank you very much. <laughs> Although it is very relevant to this as well, to be frank. Like, yeah, thank you. No, you guys are doing fantastic work. Um, thank you. See you in a bit.
Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. We will start the concluding uh, session on data governance. Uh, my colleague Ben has just arrived, so it's excellent. We'll start basically with a five minute uh, introductory remarks. Then we'll go through breakout sessions. Uh, we decided to allow more time for discussions, so it's about one hour discussions before reporting. Uh, from the six breakout sessions, 40 minutes, and then a quick conclusion to the, to the session. So, first off, um, well, we wanted to stress out the success of the data governance track. A lot of workshops were very successful during the IGF the past few days, and, well, reflecting on what Marie-Laure Denis uh, said as a sense-setting speaker, on Tuesday, out of the CNIL, she stressed the need of a collaborative approach. Well, I guess we are on the good, on the good side of it, and we had a number of sessions trying to integrate ethical and legal requirements directly into data governance. So, I um, wanted to quickly uh, come back to the six thematics uh, we identified and um, saying first that data governance needs to be integrated directly in processes and strategies. And now, on the last day of the IGF, after a number, a number of sessions, well, we had cross-border data, and we had the chance to discuss how the flow of data can contribute to the economy, can contribute to innovation, when we are allowed to discuss it in this matter. Also, uh, we had interesting discussion on the data and sustainable development and the need to stress uh, the societal agreement with regard to sharing and using data. We had uh, on the third track on data protection framework, the need of dialogue with all stakeholder groups and obviously bringing to the table civil society, which sometimes is left apart. And on the fourth track, judicial and sovereignty issues are brought forward as a matter of balance between interest and the need of cross-border agreements. We also discussed human rights issues and the need of ethics brought to data governance, raising a number of new issues, for example, digital literacy, uh, the need to learn critical thinking so that you can really accept and understand when that, what data is made of, what it is used for, and so on. And lastly, uh, we had uh, the governance and ethics of AI and algorithm track, which was very interesting as we had a number of initiatives. First, UNESCO has uh, been starting developing a global framework and obviously trying to bring a human rights-centric approach uh, and, and just enter the two-year consultative process. We have also the OECD principles, a number of initiatives at the national, regional, and sub-regional level. Uh, for example, in, in France, we just 
uh, being starting with a national AI strategy, bringing also the need of basically a common and multi-stakeholder approach in the mix. With Ben Wallace, uh, we were very happy to have the chance to lead the session, and we thought that the main uh, element uh, was basically a social element, having people brought together to discuss these issues between workshop organizers, leaders, and participants at the IGF, hearing each other, and potentially, obviously, making connection, discussing issues, and bringing these issues, obviously, by reporting to the global IGF. So, um, the plan is very simple. Um, hold on, yes. So back to the schedule. Um, we have six groups. Uh, we'll be displaying in a minute on, on the board, and one hour to discuss it with every moderator and rapporteur. Um, so cross-border data, jurisdictional and sovereignty issues, data protection framework, data and sustainable development, human rights, and internet ethics, and government, governance and ethics of AI and algorithms. So i uh, just ask every group to gather, uh, like in the introductory remarks, and thanking in advance uh, the moderator and rapporteur for bringing the report forward. Um, ben, do you want to add something? Yeah, do you, do you want to put the agenda back on? I mean, we had um, we had a lot of people in the room on Tuesday. Um, obviously, we're at the end of the week. Some people are no longer in Berlin. So just um, thinking on our feet a little bit, it, it was clear on Tuesday that actually the breakout teams would have preferred more time and there was so much discussion. There are a few people here today, so I just think we should... Um, be adaptable and, and we can kind of follow around the breakout groups. And if you feel like you've come to a natural conclusion of your discussions today, that's fine. Let us know. We don't need to take the full hour. We don't need to go until one o'clock. Uh, we'll do whatever's useful. Um, we do think it, it, it's an interesting opportunity for, uh, for you to be able to discuss what you might have heard in sessions throughout the week that relate to these particular uh, sub-themes and potentially to kind of compare where um, <clears throat> insights today relate to, uh, where there might be changes r relating to the conclusions that were come to on Tuesday. Um, if you went to the, uh, the page on the IGS schedule for this session, um, the, the reports of all of the breakout sessions from Tuesday is attached to that group um, as, a, as a reference point. But as Lucien said, I think you, know, you can have write-ups, and it was great to get the report backs, and, and we'll also um, write up what we get back today. But I think for me, what I saw was that the real value was the fact that people were getting together and having really interactive discussions, hearing different perspectives, um, maybe getting to know people who are working on these policy issues from different perspectives, from different organizations, um, and maybe hearing about sessions that were going to happen during this week. So, I'm not too concerned um, about what the written output is. I think the, the real value is in um, the social connections and the discussions in the room today. Um, so I wonder, I'm not sure we have the slide with the names of each of the breakout leaders. We do. Um, I wonder if, uh, once again, those generous volunteers um, could stand up <clears throat> and uh, Oh, if I go one by one, just to help you all. Um, so, sorry, Miguel, yes, if we go from the top. Uh, Miguel is at, at the back of the room there, towards the window. Uh, he'll be leading the breakout session on cross-border data behind him. Uh, then we have Bertrand on my left, uh, who's covering jurisdictional and sovereignty issues. And he'll be in the middle there. And um, then Chennai, who's uh, leading the session on data protection frameworks. Uh, on the other side of the room, um, Waimin is in the middle. Uh, he's doing data and sustainable development. Um, Cochettina here is human rights and internet ethics. And last but not least, um, Maria Paz on the governance and ethics of AI and algorithms. And as we did on Tuesday, in case you weren't here, um, 
the, the way that the seats behind the table are set up, they ended up being six kind of groups of uh, chairs, so it was quite natural for, for the breakout sessions to go to those chairs, so you can just turn them around, sit in a circle or a square or whatever, um, and we invite you to begin your breakout discussions. Thank you.
then the general issue of the population. So there will be something of government issue, not just the deficit. Just talking about deficits, but coming from this deficit to some governance issues, how to handle this problem. Well, there are two different angles of the same. I used to be a teacher, so I know a lot of
problem because the, for the political party, who, who is defining what is public interest? You say if, if you have a democratic, if you have a democratic agreement about that, it's not general.
effectively comes from so it's the image that we are actually building. There's, there's uh, several uh, images around, but all of them are not working. should be accessible to everyone, so everyone should base, uh, be able to be accessible. The government should uh, provide it, should bring it out from the ground, and should uh, come up with certain standards about it. But if you then decide to follow that, and it, um, to, uh, it's fine, as long as everyone has a basic product. So I still buy my coffee, but I, I'd like to have a free tap water anyway. trying to maybe find those islands and those islands of action where you can actually create something. I don't know that's well. Start maybe from there and try to expand the economy. That's I think an approach that I, I like. Let's try to find those areas where you can do something and then
Hello, everyone. It will be time soon to bring the report to the room. Can you conclude? And uh, can you conclude and uh, bring the reports? Time to come to the tables. Miguel, Bertrand, Titi, Maria, Waymin. Thank you.
it's, uh, it's mostly uh, it's my selling DLC, of course. That's it. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just talking about the the that I was expecting to take concrete measures for the degree, like very very. So it's not worth it. Okay, so we will start the reporting in in a, in a couple. Take on first with Miguel, then uh, going through the list by Bertrand, Stephanie, Waymin, and Maria. So thank you everyone for the excellent work. Um, we'll basically go through the list and have your reports. First on the list is uh, Miguel Candia uh, for the cross-border data group. Uh, Miguel, do you want to say a few words? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me the floor and good morning, everybody. Um, strictly wise, we didn't have a conversation with, because sadly um, there was no no one in the group, so I had a very long conversation with myself. And uh, then joined sovereignty issues. That was a very nice uh, group to, to discuss. But I, I did want to share with you uh, some of the ideas that were uh, floated on, on, the, on the introductory meetings, and as well uh, some uh, sense and some ideas that were reflected on different uh, sessions that took over cross border cross-border data, and uh, what were the big issues and where, where lies the, the unrest and the, and the hope for the future. So uh, basically, the, the first instance to understand is that uh, with data crossing more often and more, uh, and more borders than any, any time in the, uh, in the history of, of mankind, uh, it sounds big, but basically it is but it is not right now. Now we have to reconcile the, the rights of, of the end users and the interest of companies in order to have a proper development of international uh, standards, regulations, and legislation. Uh, and this needs to be, uh, according to many, many voices that I heard throughout the week, this needs to be able to be constantly updated. So we need to set the, the scene, we need to put the settings, but we need to be able to show uh, very much uh, flexibility in the, fact, in the way we do things in order for it to evolve with the situations as they, as they present themselves in the future, both near and long-term future. And uh, the other particular point was the extraterritorial effect of, uh, of decision-making from companies affecting legislation from different uh, governments, from different countries, from different uh, um, territories, uh, legislatively wise, because you have both uh, economical and social, as well as, uh, for example, taxing systems, that uh, the same data 
uh, creates, uh, creates uh, resources for different countries and different companies and different, uh, and, and different uh, jurisdictions. So uh, the other one, uh, one of the other issues was the, the difference or the gap now that we, we have lots of different kinds of gaps, but uh, the, developing, the development gap between developed countries and developing countries that, uh, in regards of the, um, the level of the quality of the regulation that they are uh, or have already developed or not, and how everybody else is subject to those rules even if they are not, even if it, it was not accepted by one of the parties, sometimes uh, they are uh, limited to do what those regulations, foreign regulations, uh, tell them to do. And this could happen both between developed and developing or developed and developed regions. Um, how to deal with, this challenge, with, with these challenges and situations? Uh, we are in an UN setting, and this was mentioned several times. Uh, cooperation is international cooperation is one option and the preferred one, not not particularly in the sense of a convention of international regulations, more in the sense of international cooperation, both by regional either to, for between two regional groups or um, uh, country to country, and of course taking into account the, the the far more, the far bigger number of players, such as companies, uh, civil society, um, the private sector, and, and in, uh, the technical community itself, in order to show, uh, to show dedication and take to the debates and processes around the big issue of data governance and the narrower issue of uh, how we treat data crossing borders. So this, uh, I, I, as a conclusion, I just wanted to put this uh, information through you and let you know that uh, because it is intertwined with all the groups and you will have to speak about a bit about uh, data, uh, data cross-border data while talking about your own uh, findings in your own groups, uh, seems to be that uh, Data itself is in the heart of every discussion we have, and cross-border data is going to change the world in the way uh, we see national states and the, and the way we see international community. And we should make the most of it in order to achieve the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much, and thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. I uh, would like to give the floor to Bertrand de la Chapelle from the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network to report from the traditional and sovereignty issue. You have the floor, Bertrand. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of topics that are related to those issues, and the, the approach that we chose or that I suggested for the, for the group was basically to ask people what were the takeout uh, that they had from uh, the sessions that they attended. And in some cases, so we didn't cover absolutely everything. There's no effort at being synthetic about all the dimensions of sovereignty and jurisdiction. Uh, it was more picking a few topics that popped up, even some that at first didn't seem to connect very closely to the issue of sovereignty or jurisdiction and to actually understand why there was an underlying problem that was related to that. And so I will take four, uh, four elements quickly. Uh, the first comment that was made uh, connected to several sessions that introduced the importance of taking into account the layers of the internet when we talk about regulation, when we talk about sovereignty and jurisdictions. And the uh, fact that there is a strong difference when we talk about the internet, between the technical in, and logical infrastructure, which is still global and not really fracturing that much, and the applications and content layers that are much more subject to the diversity of national laws, etc. In each case, in each case, there are exceptions. 
because even at the infrastructure layer, layer there was a, a very um, interesting argument, anecdotal element, but important, which is that uh, in the case of Paraguay, for instance, which is a landlocked country, the desire to have sovereignty and a guarantee of access led the country to establish its own cables to make sure that it had connectivity. So there is an argument about sovereignty at the national, at the technical level, but the most of the debate is taking place at the um, higher level of, uh, of content. And um, there was even a comment, I think, uh, worth uh, reporting on, which is that there might be ulterior motives for people who actually are purposefully or systematically conflicting the two and saying the internet is fragmenting where actually they don't make the distinction. So the first message was to keep in mind the distinction between the layers, <clears throat> what we at Internet and Jurisdiction qualify as the governance of the internet and governance on the internet, but whatever the label is, keep in mind that when we talk about the internet, there are different layers and that governance is probably has to be adapted uh, to those layers in terms of the exercise of sovereignty. The second element started with uh, misinformation. And at first there was a, a bit of uh, ambivalence, including uh, for me as moderator, because it didn't seem to be a direct relation to data governance. And actually after some discussion, it turned out that the connecting point was the notion of integrity of the electoral processes and that fundamentally when we talk about misinformation, we can have very divergent views on whether um, restricting content is the appropriate strategy, whether even if we don't agree with what people are saying, it needs to be left online because it's part of the democratic debate. But what is clear is that the notion of integrity of the electoral process is a key element in the sovereignty uh, of nations and communities, and that in particular what was really of concern was the misuse of data for targeting um, users according to their political orientation or specific uh, qualities. And so this is how the connection between misinformation, sovereignty and data uh, was made, and I think it was uh, an important element, so integrity electoral process. Uh, the third one was, again, emerging around the notion of data sharing. And we had an interesting discussion on the fact that even if there is the technical infrastructure, there's the layer of content, there's also another layer that is purely economical, that is the economics of data, or the data economy. And that it functions in a slightly different way than the uh, other um, economic environments that we are accustomed to. Um, including around the notion of the sharing of data. And there was an interesting discussion about the um, sh data sharing for public interest data, there, there were, or the approach of public interest sharing, which was the object of one uh, session this week, uh, but also the sharing of data for development purposes and what one of the participants called that digital industrialization. Uh, there was another distinction that was made, which I think is, is interesting around um, data sharing, which is sharing among people, among individuals, and that connects to the question of data portability, for instance. Uh, there's the sharing among companies, where sometimes it's beneficial for the companies to share proprietary data because it adds to, for instance, the database that an um, artificial intelligence engine can, um, uh, can develop. And the third element being the public interest uh, objective of sharing of data, for instance, collecting traffic data from certain apps to help the functioning of smart cities. I won't get into details, but what is very interesting is that it, it showed the importance of the governance of data, the connections between three terms, two that are very familiar in the environment of internet governance. One is free flow of data or data flows, and on the other hand, data protection. And there is a thinking that actually we should more think in terms of a triangle where the third dimension, which is data sharing or data mutualization maybe, is uh, a dimension that is insufficiently um, adopted or, or taken into account. 
And um, this was a transition to the last point that I want to finish with, which is that the way data functions and the economy of data calls for agreements internationally. And it calls for um, a specific shared responsibilities between the governments, the companies, and so on. And the last point that we discussed was there is at the moment too much debate, probably, on where those discussions should take place. Should it be only among governments, um, WTO or other international organizations? Should it be fully multi-stakeholder? Should it be among a few uh, actors or everybody around the table from the onset? And this is detrimental to actually addressing the topic because we can spend a lot of time discussing on what is the appropriate venue and meanwhile, we don't address something that is actually at the core of the, of the debate. And this is a loop with the very first point I was making, because in governance of the internet, we have institutions. They work more or less. People may have qualms, but they do work. Uh, I can, the IETF, World War Web Consortium. In governance on the internet, we have the IGF, but we have an embryonic system. But for data governance, we don't really know where those discussions actually bring all the actors together. So these are the four points that we, that we addressed, and it was actually a very, um, a very fruitful discussion. And if anybody, uh, after the different presentations from the group, wants to add to it, I may have forgotten something. Thank you. Thank you, Bertrand, for the excellent summary. Moving on on the next track, data protection frameworks, I would like first to thank Chennai Chair from the Web Foundation, uh, that had to oh, yeah, which had to leave us and give the floor to Stephanie, uh, which will report for the data protection track. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Stephanie. Um, I'm a NetMission ambassador from um, NetMission.Asia in Hong Kong. So um, we had a very fruitful organization on what are the difficulties of the um, data protection framework we can see. So um, first of all, we can see that um, currently uh, in a law perspective, um, there are uh, different jurisdiction in different countries that makes it very hard for the countries to really to harmonize a global um, data protection framework. And even we can see that different countries actually have their own needs for data protection. So we actually come to a point that um, to find out it's actually hard to find a one size fits all solution um, in terms of to uh, establish a global data protection framework. Uh, and also, uh, when it comes to like ethical perspective or competitive, competitiveness perspective, we realize that a data protection framework actually would be a good business selling point for the industry. And um, but still, it's very hard like to find a common ground. And also, um, maybe indeed, many views are currently very contradictory uh, when it comes to data protection. And there's also a uh, difficulty in monitoring and evaluation and how um, we can, uh, we still lack like a further protection for our open data and big data. So what can we do? So we actually raised an um, example from Kenya that they currently um, collaborate with the European, uh, the Council of Europe that they actually had a very localized data protection framework. Uh, what we can see from this example is that we can have a bottom-up approach um, to, um, to establish this data protection framework, and meanwhile, it could actually motivate um, more part of the civil society to uh, participate. So, um, what's more? Yes, so we actually also touch on many other issues like uh, data deletion and data sharing. So we eventually had an interesting idea. So we we're saying like, what if we have a data literacy license, like our driver license, that to ensure everybody has the um, literacy to uh, use data and to uh, use the internet properly. So it would be a interesting question to uh, continue this discussion. Yes. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, moving on to the data and sustainable development track, I will give the floor to Wei Min from UNDESA. Thank you. 
Um, my name is Waimin Kwok. I'm from the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. So thank you to the moderator for uh, inviting us to be, I think it's a, it's a nice closure. We started off this and we are coming back to this same room. Uh, no doubt it's with a smaller group and also different, different people, but we still have a very engaged discussion. In our group, uh, we have a government representative from Chad, we have someone from Wikipedia, uh, from the Research Institute, from the business. So it's really, it's really a good mix and we have an interesting discussion. Um, we, we, while looking at um, data governance through the lens of the subsidiary development, uh, we actually look at the, more like the one thing that, um, that is actually very clear is actually missing data of the Global South. So that came up in a few of discussions and that also I think is also echo the, some other discussion that happened this week. So, so for that, that actually relate to issues on digital identity, the data gaps, and what's, um, what we all need to do in terms of either we identify to look at, um, either we call it high priority data or high value data. Uh, when in some instances, when there is actually as much as 90% of the data is, is missing, there's a need to, to look at the priority in terms of uh, making the best use of the resources. Um, we, I will highlight then next maybe t perhaps three points uh, on what the group felt that there was some but not sufficient discussion um, during this IGF and that could perhaps be considered um, um, as a, for the following uh, IGF in, by the host countries, like in Poland next year. So one, the, the first of which is data literacy. As we talk about data governance, there's... Um, there seems to be uh, uh, underappreciation of the importance of uh, data literacy. That could mean how to read and write as a, as, as a basic element, how to, how to consume data, how to produce data, how to assess data. And the data is also of different types. Um, in the introductory, I, I recall also from one government to say that in a lot of developing countries, there are still a lot of analog data. Um, but today discussion, there's also a point that we have so much of digital data, perhaps, how do we look at converting the digital data to analog so that it be consumed by farmers, by communities the, that, that actually uh, lack, the, lack, lack the literacy? Another point that uh, perhaps missing about the data governance uh, discussion is on the implementation. As we discussed about the different data governance model, we talk about policies, uh, talk about standards, protocols, need for open data, need for open license for open data. So all these are all good, but um, as specific implementation and monitoring the implementation, uh, looking at the output, outcome, impact, all these are actually uh, important parts. And we do know implementation, like we are all making challenge, uh, making reference to GDPR, but even for GDPR, there are many challenges in implementation or in interpretation of the possible inter uh, implementation measures. The, the last gap that uh, the group also discussed uh, is about there is uh, also the linkage of uh, data governance to, to the multidisciplinary approach, including research. Um, we heard a lot about science policy interface, but there seems to be a need to look at the data policy interface. Um, there's actually this, this question about what is actually needed for research institutes and, and other uh, academia, uh, civil society, to look at meeting all the challenges that they get. Thank you. Thank you, Amin. So we have two tracks left, uh, human rights and internet ethics and governance and ethics of AI and algorithms. So due to merging of the two tracks, um, well, I give the floor to Maria for summarizing uh, the discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in our case, we have also a rapporteur. Julia will present uh, the summary of the conversation for, for the two break uh, sessions that uh, merger. Um, but basically, we, we feel that there is a, a still a lot of energy and, and engagement of the participant that can be uh, provided for the future conversation and the future version of the, of the IGF. So uh, I'm, I'm very glad to report in general sense that um, there is a lot of space for continued this collaboration. And I will invite also as a final remark to all the other groups and participants in the other groups to do the same, like not 
uh, abandon this conversation when they leave this room, but rather the other way around to find a ways to keep engaged either through the BPF uh, work that it's intersectional around the year, uh, using the resources of the report that will be available in the website of the IGF, and also uh, many of the gaps that were identified uh, here in the conversation in terms of the question or the topics that were not addressed this year are very good suggestions for proposing workshops and other kind of sessions for, for next year version. So I, I invite you all, not only from my group, but all the groups that have been participating in this conversation today to keep that energy and to kind of channel in this continued participation in the IGF. So Julia will give us the report. Thank okay. you. So luckily, our themes were uh, rather similar between the two groups, so we decided to merge. So the main topic that we discussed today was what possible frameworks could guide AI governance and how technical or regulatory approaches can contribute going forwards. So we're really summing up the last week and talking about what's happened, and there were kind of three main themes that emerged, as Maria mentioned. Firstly, AI uh, ethics fr frameworks. Currently, there's an incredible plurality and diversity of frameworks around the world, and it's kind of difficult to understand what's common between them. So we had a discussion of how we can pull these together and see what are the emerging topics that are common denominators between them all. So topics such as do no harm came out, but we think there might be others that could also be uh, agreed upon. We also discussed how we can understand each nation's view and tools and strategies for going about that. Some people discussed, is there a way to ask different nations specifically, where others pointed to a need to investigating the policies and strategies as many countries now have their own AI strategies in place. We also discussed how this is a challenge, as even agreeing on a definition for AI is incredibly challenging. Currently, many groups are using a fluid or a growing definition, as, as they do not want to allow this to become a barrier to having discussion about policy at all. Um, however, we're hopeful at this, the U, uh, UNESCO is currently in the process of making a human rights based uh, AI framework and that this will be the first piece of, I think, uh, standard coming from the UN body. The second topic in terms of regulation, we had a discussion about how some people believe that an AI framework is toothless and regulation is needed in a lot of countries where there, as AI has a tendency to take things that have been in the past and move them into the future. So this means that specific countries should be able to regulate uh, where they, will, they want and do not want AI to be used. However, m other members mentioned how this is important to see who is setting policy and to have a real world view in terms of cultural context and the people's trust in their governments. And lastly, in terms of topics for next year, we, uh, members hope to see more and more discussion of the morals of AI how far we want to take AI in terms of protecting what makes us human and AI as a supporting role. And lastly, a further discussion of AI's role in job displacement and e-governance. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I would like now to open the floor for comments, remarks, and for the discussion. For, we have like five minutes, and then Ben will uh, set the, the next steps and and light us in this. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you very much. My name is Horst Kramer, Skodida, Germany. Um, what I suggest um, to give the whole procedure a little bit of more management-oriented structure, like uh, uh, getting a uh, opening the, the structures of information, of governance, the term of governance means that um, actors discuss strategy and initiate groups to work on these policies, procedures, processes, controls and implementations to manage information together with not only the current techniques and methods, but those techniques and methods needed uh, and risks and operational requirements. These are substructures of governance rather than solutions. So that is, that is what I um, suggest um, to do to make clear what we understand on governance. And then we see what kind of discussion groups are missing. When I see the, the problem of really coming up with a governance procedure, then 
Uh, one of my suggestions would be either have topic-oriented governance, sub-topics oriented, not thematic topics, but governance-oriented uh, uh, substructures in IGF regional conferences and come up, come away from ad hoc communities as they gather here to, 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 to see the benefit of top-down structures uh, of professional societies, like one of these structures will be the International Council of Science, with don't, not only the Science Council, but its members, and down to the national organizations that come up with that substructures. Not only ask the top people, but ask those people and address them, make them aware this is really important and we need their opinion. That would be a, a, a broader thing and also officially ask the research foundations, not only offer to come here, but ask the research foundations and technical organizations uh, to really uh, make, a, make a position statement rather than uh, if they are not able to, to take place here. So I think uh, I will leave it like that. There are some other things that I say cross-border semantic mapping would be necessary, something of the, of the practical thing. What I didn't see discussed is self-destroying data where you have some kind of finishing line or kind of restrictions of data that that we said what to do and what not to do with, with that data. Not just put it on the table, but also to say what not to do. We don't have implementation means of this. Everyone needs it. Something like that, yeah, these discussions. Thank you. Thank you. On the, on the left, you have the floor. Okay, yeah, sorry, I'm Parminder from IT for Change. And what I saw this year was that there has been shift in what Ran spoke about it, that in earlier years around data, a lot of talk about free flow of data and data protection was already there, but this time, first time, data sharing, and that brings to the table the economic aspects of data was brought up. And that also brings not only personal data, we have obsessed with the personal data, which is very important, but AI engines largely work on relations between data and non-personal data, and AI is the one big value created and how it will be distributed among nations. The geopolitics of data has a big economic aspect to it and non-personal data aspect to it. And this started coming, and I hope in the next IGF, having spoken this time, that sharing of data is necessary. We'll also start talking about how would sharing of data actually take place and what are the institutions of sharing of data. It's not something in the ethereal space that sharing will take place. There's a full-fledged institutional development which has to take place around sharing of data, and how would that take place? And that's particularly very important for developing countries and laggards in digital industrialization. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last comment from Bertrand, and then I'll give the floor to Ben for concluding. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to, uh, to share that I'm extremely happy about this format. Uh, I was honestly cautious um, initially, although I've always advocated for tracks in, um, in uh, Internet uh, Governance Forum. This is the first time that there is this sort of bookending of, uh, of sessions. Uh, the short discussion format was really, really uh, substantive. The notion that people have an opportunity to uh, piggyback and, and reflect on what they have experienced in the different meetings is, uh, is really great, and I strongly encourage that this is, uh, be reconducted uh, in the future um, IGFs because it's, uh, it's really a good exercise, and as a moderator, I really, really uh, enjoyed it. Uh, the second thing is, as I mentioned at the end, one of the main benefits of the IGF is that we set aside where the discussion should take place to focus on the substance. And this is something that is really missing. Uh, it's a bit of self-promotion because that's what we try to do in, in, in the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. But we should be more open to discussing the substance, and one typical example is what um, Parminder was mentioning around data sharing. Yes, this is something that I personally take out of this IGF, is that there were a session that I could not attend because of a conflict, but we discussed it a little bit here. Adding this third dimension of 